Greetings and welcome once again to another episode of the Retro Reductibus Cephala Podcast. And that's the only show that celebrates all the things that made growing up awesome. As always, we are part of the Dorkening and Inebriart Podcast, and we are brought to you tonight by Deadly Grounds Coffee, which is like, like seriously, just really good coffee. Um, with me tonight uh, on this amazing episode of uh, The Brig are my two buddies, my cohorts, my, my co-hosts with the mo-hosts, uh, Nintendo and What's up? Ace Good Alchemy. <laughs> hey 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 they're here they're here and some of you may be watching this on video so you already know you're like yeah i know um i can see see your dumb faces yeah like it's weird i mean you don't want to see us generally because we're we're really not that much to look at but and we we smell bad well speak speak for yourselves Uh, i i am speaking Uh, for myself i'm the cute yeah you're right i'm the cute joe's not much to look at we're pretty good though oh oh i i I thought it was the other the other thing the other way around no okay no you're right what um anyway but hey you know we uh we have a fourth square on the screen here and this man this man i'm gonna i'm gonna give him a proper intro okay okay now i i, I wrote it down all right here we go you right you guys ready for this ready, you guys ready for this all right here y'all ready for this tonight we've got a real treat for you in the listening world and uh the video world and all the worlds uh and to think all we needed to do was to discover a meteor hitherto unknown to science and then chip away small bits of said meteor in order to make a trail leading to our studio in Massachusetts through the door, down the stairs, and all the way into uh, the brig. Okay, granted that joke works better in the video version. Uh, Tonight, our guest is a real man about town. He's aware of all the hats. Writer, director, actor, playwright, author, illustrator, cartoonist, absurdist, humorist. My voice gets higher as I go doer of science here to change the way people think about the things that they don't think about why it's none other than larry blamire welcome to the show larry wow thank you thank you guys thank you so much mind blown because you know more things about me than i know what oh my goodness (laughs) too busy doing all the science that's why yeah 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 you know that's uh that's the problem science is uh such a jealous mistress <laughs> as i like it's to all say. encompassing really it, it yeah. is uh but at least it pays really well <laughs> yeah yeah they say that but uh so tonight uh you know we're just incredibly happy to have you on the show larry this is just very exciting we are all big fans of yours and uh you uh of course have done very many things uh a lot of which we we've gotten to experience movies books um there was there was a uh i guess it's a web cat like a web show i don't know what's called it like that uh very twilight zoney tales from the pub you, you guys did a while ago it was like 16 episodes what, what do you call that like it was like a mini web show you know we we never gave it any kind of name it was we were bet- between movies and we wanted to sort of keep fresh and keep active and artistic and just started doing those things and uh um, and they just kind of happen and we put them up on, on YouTube. So I, I guess, I guess it is kind of an, un, uh, you know, un, unplanned web series, if you will. Web series, right. Tales from the pub. Yes. Yeah. Yep. It, it, which I recommend everybody go watch right now. All yeah. 16 episodes are absolutely <laughs> hilarious. They, they frequently leave me in stitches, no matter how many times I watch certain ones. I just, uh, I mean, and, and eight bit. It, yeah, and uh, I, I mean, so. I, I was literally like thinking about this episode today and and I was like think, looking forward to recording it. And I, and I was just expecting Larry, you know, you to be on it and to just go, it, it can't be, but it, it is it's <laughs> me. <laughs> that, that is my favorite. Yeah, that's that, my favorite episode. Like, yeah, the, the HM, why the not? HM. Watch as she dances. Yeah, like, the, uh, the puppet. The puppet that's a, for your that's, thoughts. Yeah, that one is always mentioned as uh, among the favorites. Puppet for your thoughts. And the other one, one that is my uh, personal favorite, maybe alongside that one, is um, I think it's called Mind Over Matter. I should know. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, about yeah. The, uh, the salt yeah. shaker and the amazing. Yeah. Uh, uh, mentalism that moves that salt shake with Brian Howe and Dan Conroy uh, yeah. just, just selling the hell out of that one. 
yeah. that just I, I still I, I watch them and they make me laugh. Those guys. Yeah, <laughs> I mean that one is just it's it, it's all about the reactions, right? Because they're so incredibly genuine. Yeah. So you're you're you have this juxtaposition of like the stupidest possible shit on the video. Like they're they could not possibly be this stupid. Yeah. But they're they are selling it like to the cheap seats, and it's. <laughs> It's just the best. It's so, it just works. It absolutely works. I mean, my personal favorite is, uh, and I've mentioned this to you before, is uh, Message from the Beyond, which is uh, your episode. And uh, it's, it's you and Brian Howe. And uh, with our native I'm accent. Always, yeah, yeah. Yeah, with the Boston <laughs> accent. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I got a message from you from, from the, from the beyond, from the beyond. I got I think a, I've received a message for you from the beyond. I, I, I could just about do the whole, the whole episode, uh, long talk Lottie and uh, your lip, you know, you got a wife or your wife's lips are in danger. Well, what's wrong with the lips? Nothing. The lips are fine. Like the whole, the whole thing is just like, absolutely. And the names, the names you, in that one, do you know a Sherpy log, log neuter? Log neuter. <laughs> Sherpy log neuter is my favorite of your names. Oh, oh it just is. stupid. It, it's so it was good. so good. So good. Because you really have this talent um, for creating very silly names and also uh, just just made up words. I mean, you you literally have three books worth. Uh, yeah. Called oh, yeah. The, yeah. the Blammery yeah. Terms. Blammery of Terms. Three volumes. Of terms. Yeah. And you got your like your Monday movies. I do have I the first like you, volume right here. That plays uh, into it. If, if people on the video can see it backwards. They're uh, I, and they're either good. words that are made up or they're words that exist but given a new meaning i guess so right repurposing um, them but that words right. are fun for me Wh whatever i'm writing uh the words are the best part and names coming up with names is just something i just i've always taken joy in it absolutely it's one of my favorite things honestly uh with your stuff is to is to like see what the the cast is going to be called because you sort of got <laughs> crazier and crazier as you went like um you know we well i'm kind of getting ahead of myself this is kind of planned for later but uh, that's what we do um the, the the names in skeleton one lost skeleton of cadavera which is the main reason we're here tonight because it's the 20th anniversary of lost skeleton of cadavera Man. so congratulations on, on yeah that. congrats really, really cool thank you um this is the movie that uh introduced us to your work i think it's the movie that introduced a lot of people to your work and uh, it's really cool. You've been posting all these awesome uh, photos on mm -hmm. Facebook. And uh, these, uh, I, I, I think they're all uh, Robert DeVoe, Bob DeVoe yep. pictures. So they're like, and he was the man who, uh, your friend who played the, the farmer. Yes, he did. Yes, he who did. Had and, a, yeah. Insinuated he, was the, cow. he was there for the first, uh, I think it was the first three days. And that was the shoot at Bronson Canyon. His, that's, oh. his character, the farmer, is um, it's only in, he's only in that section. So, but Bob brought his camera, and thank God he did, and uh, and so it was really neat. Twenty years later, to have these unearthed these these uh, the only on set photos taken from this shoot because wow. it was such a a whirlwind. The last thing we were thinking about, you know, we didn't have it was two thousand, we didn't have cell phones. The last thing we we're thinking about is is taking pictures really as we're doing this. But Bob right. had the presence of mind to do that. And I'm really glad he did. That's so is awesome. this the first time that in a long time you had gotten to see these pictures or? I had never seen most of them. And Bob just oh. had not scanned them. And uh, he had scanned a few that we used, you know, uh, for like vintage trading cards that didn't exist, that kind of thing. Maybe a handful, right. you know, but most right. of them I'd never seen before. And uh, and so it was nice to be able to, unveil, to, to see them and unveil them to the, the fans. Yeah. Um, and and it's and it made the shoot a little more concrete in my memory because, I mean, it's, you know, we're talking, you know, 10 days, 10, 10 11 days, 20 years ago. And uh, um, and so that that's a short amount of time a while ago. And so yeah. it's, kind of, it's kind of vague, kind of hazy. It's like a blur at this point, right? So you're seeing these pictures and things are coming back to you, which is, which is a nice feeling. So it was really, it was great. Yeah. And some of these pictures are, are just, just beautiful. Like there, there is, there is a picture of Brian Howe that the, the foreground is blurred and the depth of field is just so that like, he's the only thing in, 
in focus. It's it's and he's looking kind of just off into the distance. It's just a incredibly great picture. Yes, like a lot. Bob, yeah, Bob has a good eye, so uh, yeah. so that helped. And he's a director himself. He works and he works in. He was a theater director and an actor in theater, but he also works in uh, audio visual. So he 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 was uh, yeah he was the one to do it. He took some some phenomenal pictures. Well, hey, you know, I think that's cool as hell that uh, that you also are seeing these for the first time because it's been really yeah. fun these past few weeks. And that's really what kind of uh, spurred like I've, I've wanted to have you on the show for like literally years, but I, right. I was never sure like exactly what the right topic was, because generally we talk about nostalgia and things that, you know, we liked growing up. Mm -hmm. We have different generations than you. I tend to like um, I, I'm. I'm a huge fan of old fifties movies and forties and thirties and all this stuff, but right. the other guys in the podcast aren't as much. So it just, I just wasn't sure, but this just, we're not like, cool enough. It's not about <laughs> being cool. You're cool. Now, now not everybody can be cool. I know one day, <laughs> you know, maybe you got to eat enough corn. <laughs> I'm trying. I'm corn. trying. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, it's it's just uh it was just cool that you w were posting that and then you had a little you had a little hint somebody said something and then you said something else and it was like oh it sounded like maybe there's a kickstarter in the works and it All turns right. out that not only was there a kickstarter in the works holy crap it literally premiered today the day that this episode is airing right now is tuesday the 30th we we like to call it technical tuesday six but days maybe. in the future from recording yeah, which is crazy to think. <laughs> but for the listening now, now, now with the listening, yeah, um, it's live. So we're gonna definitely spend a lot of time on the Kickstarter, and I'm I'm psyched. And uh, I I personally just to hint at, I don't want to say what it is, but well, you can it say awesome. it now. You can say it now. The, uh, the genie's out of the bag, as they say. <laughs> Heard that. Well, cram that bitch back in there. No, yeah, that's not nice. That's nice. Um, she. So, so tell us about the genie then. Let's let's talk about the genie. The let's genie is uh, the, the metaphorical genie, if you will, is actually something I've been wanting to see happen for years, which is the La Skeleton of Cadavra lunchbox. Yes. Uh, deluxe. Now, there was the first sign of a lunchbox was back in the original DVD release. Um, there were these, this great, great extra called, uh, and there's a lot of great extras on that disc, uh, Skelectables. And it was yeah. uh, basically uh, my buddy Courtney Skinner, who's a great artist, he was hired to create all these uh, retro collectible items that never existed um, for La Scala Cadaver. Like back in the early 60s, it came out like that. And, you know, and they had all these great, great things. Uh, like a board game and uh, trading cards and 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 he he made these incredibly convincing and retro looking and uh, um, of course the funny thing is that this low budget movie in the early sixties would actually have all of this merchandise I mean that's kind of funny but it doesn't matter um, so Courtney gets so the lunchbox was one of those things and ever since then people have gone, oh, I really wish you had that lunchbox. <laughs> And I would buy that lunchbox, Larry. Oh, yeah, yeah. I would put lunch in it, man. And, um, man, I so, put a uh, Shabibin witch in there. <laughs> yeah. And so, <laughs> Darn right. so we now have a Kickstarter to make that happen. Um, and uh, I won't uh, uh, say too much about the, 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 the box itself, except, uh, I mean, the art, because there is new art. Um, and the main piece on the side uh, was was the same piece Courtney had done years ago, but now of course you've got now it's dimensional. It's in the real mm -hmm. world, and you know that's like three dimensions at least, right? So, um, so there's like other things on the box, and uh, you can see them on the Kickstarter, like other other things on there. Uh, it's slightly smaller than the usual lunchbox size, but not by much. Just a tiny bit smaller. Good for portion control. <laughs> Good. Yeah, yeah right right we're all you could all, spin it on and yeah you know people are all concerned that. about that and uh um uh the thing that that people have always wanted it for um well that i hear the most from fans is to hold their blu-rays you know that we put out the, the mm -hmm. discs we put out yeah. this will in fact indeed hold that um there is no thermos people were saying is, is there a thermos too well it's just it's just a lunchbox but hopefully hopefully that's enough 
this lunchbox almost acts as like an ultra wide steel book. Yeah. Right? Like, like it's not <laughs> yeah. a true steel book, but it's like, it's got, it's like ultra deep <laughs> steel yeah. book edition of Lost Skeleton. That's exactly a good way to put it. Yeah. yeah. I did see yeah, a yeah, funny comment somebody had made on uh, one of, one of the posts you had made last week. Somebody pay, somebody asked uh, if it comes with a tip, tip, tip thermos. Yeah. The tip, <laughs> that is funny though. You got to admit that is funny. I, I, I grant you that. That was clever. I liked it. <laughs> I liked it. Unfortunately, it's still not in there. So it's still not it. It doesn't matter how funny the goddamn joke is. It's not in it's there. It's not in there. Drunk. <laughs> not, drunk. not making a thermos. Okay. <laughs> I love I love this art, and I'm so happy that it's new. It's so great. Uh, That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, I mean, Courtney is just Courtney's just amazing. Uh, Court, Courtney is, is the guy that built the uh, the mutant for Lost Girl and Cadaver, the original mutant, and. Um, he never got out to the shoot. He had to ship that to us. The mutant really? was shipped oh, wow. to us. It's still he still has the head. It still exists. The rest of it decayed um, over the years, and uh, it was uh, quite a creation. Um, and um, uh, he did a, a, a terrific job with that. And he's done he's he's done some uh, some art on uh, on uh, uh, my other films too. He did some digital work for Lost Skeleton Returns again. And he did the wonderful portraits in Dark yes. and Stormy Night, yes. which line the halls uh, where you've got, you know, the classic walking down the old dark house hall with staring paintings. And, and, uh, and of course, two of them have eyes that, that move, that open up and a person is looking through them and stuff. Anyway, he did all those. Which are just, you know, incredible. I mean, just yeah. incredible artwork. They're yeah. absolutely incredible. That's awesome. uh, I remember years ago uh, learning that that he was the man who did all yeah. these all these portraits. But when I first saw Dark and Stormy Night, I I really took notice of the portraits, and I was I was just like blown away at how many there were and how high quality they they are because they 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 walk that line of very realistic cartoons. It's like they don't look real, but they look like real cartoon. If cartoons were real. They walk, they walk the line of grotesque. Yeah. It's just, they're just, they're just, just enough, but not just, they're still believable. That's what, that's so the way you walk that line. It's, it's perfect. They're really, really freaky. They're they, they really are just awesome. Um, yeah. So um, guys, if, if, uh, if anybody needs to, you know, just shut me up, just like, you know, jump in there and say, Steve, shut, shut up and i'll like shut up. your face but I, i'm gonna try to i'm gonna try to steer the ship a little bit but so yeah i mean you know be our rudder yeah go for yeah. it so um go on, i do want to talk you, we're with you man we're with you man oh, oh, okay. 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 the main sail oh man it's really cool that everybody believes in me it's thanks thanks guys um take the helm will you take the helm man <clears throat> what do you want me to take it um all right <laughs> so i want to I want to, uh, so we, we have mentioned, so you've written and directed and started in four movies just to briefly go through them. It, it is the lost skeleton of cadaver, which was 2001. And then, uh, the follow-up to that was the trail of the screaming forehead, well, which first was, I did, I did actually did Johnny Slade's greatest hits before Forehead. So oh, actually, see, I, I always forget that one. I always yeah, well, it's that outside. The, it's, it's not genre. It's, it's different. It's very different. And, and it was that a, was that a Bantam street? Was that your company? No, that was uh, uh, an old buddy of mine, uh, John Fiore, um, uh, who's an actor um, in Boston. And uh, he had, uh, I had actually, before that, I'd written a mafia comedy for him called This Thing of Ours, oh. which um, he uh, commissioned me to write. And uh, that did not get off the ground. But then he got interested in doing this thing about this nightclub singer. And, and so he asked me, commissioned me to... Uh, to write it and direct it. And it brought me back to Massachusetts, which was cool. So we, uh, we shot it there and uh, some of the Sopranos cast was in it. And uh, it was, uh, it was a lot of fun, very different from these other movies. And of course, after that, I went back to the, the sort of flavor, the Lost Skeleton flavor. Right. Right. Really screaming for it. Right. Right. All right. Well, yep. Thanks. So I, yeah, I, so I missed that. My homework was uh, incomplete. I have seen that movie. Uh, I did, I did seek it out. Once upon a time, it's like a guy's like a lounge singer guy, but his job is he's supposed to sing the names of whoever's going to get killed. Right. That's the idea. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 
that was so that was also really funny um we have so so back to the the proper bantam uh trail of screaming forehead which you hinted at at the end of lost skeleton because there's a little like yes. marvel mcu like after the credits little right thing and it <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That does have a little trail of the screaming yeah, forehead yeah uh that's right and and uh and and the reason was it was already written by that point because when we wrapped lost skeleton i immediately you know you're kind of still flying on that adrenaline and so forehead started coming to me so i wrote that fairly quickly and uh on the on the on the tail of uh, skeleton and by the time we we uh finished the uh, post production on on skeleton we were able to put that little uh, that little teaser at the end so, right yeah well if i know anything about foreheads i mean they're they're fast they they take no prisoners they you know it, when they need to assert themselves a forehead will a they forehead say. asserts that's yeah. what they why, say why are you uh why are you uh hiding yours steve there's nothing wrong is there uh, anything you don't want us to see oh my god oh, that's that's forehead. I perfectly uh, normal Damn it's it. just it's just a zit just a forehead. That's all. <laughs> is it? Yeah, it is. I'm 42 freaking years old. Anyway. Um, anyway, forehead's great. And forehead was the first of the Blu-rays that you came out with, right? Uh, now I have to think a second. I think I, th- I, I think it was. Unless I'm wrong. Well, was I, it, I think was Lost it... Skeleton Returns again was the first. Oh, that was the first. I believe that was the first. And um, And when the the executive producer, we, we went to the executive producer forehead and said, look, we did this cool job with this and we'd really love to do the same with forehead because it hadn't gotten, uh, hadn't gotten really a proper release. And um, uh, so that was, that was a really cool thing. And we had the uh, different, uh, different cuts too, two different cuts on the, uh, on the Blu-ray. So right. that was nice. My longer yeah, so- cut and the uh, release cut. And one of them has a they they have completely different scores. Uh, right. yeah, not I don't I think I think the release cut retains some of the DeWolf music, but uh, my version has all DeWolf music. Oh, okay. DeWolf okay. is a is a uh, production music library, uh, much like Valentino, which is the company I used in Lost Skeleton. Um, I love movie music. Putting in the music is one of my favorite things to do. Absolutely, and it. using using the the stock you know stuff it, it's just it adds to just how perfect it is it all like because that's the thing about skeleton and i do want to swing back around to you know that is our meat and potatoes of the episode but like skeleton it, it could be a movie that you're parodying so easily right it could be the genuine article you know just like it's, it's, it's such a true to form parody that it if you showed it to the right person they might not know it's like it's so truly genuine but also the comedy is so absurdly there that i do feel like you would catch on you know if you're if you're really paying attention but but yeah like i mean you could mistake it for the for the real for the you know the real thing the source material thank you thank you and it was uh, it, it, it did fool some people early on. In fact, we actually encouraged that by saying it was a lost film found in our sort of press material. We were right. trying to, I mean, we, we knew we couldn't go too far with that. Right. Only, you know, yeah. just have fun with it because first of all, there's, there was the IMDB in 2000. People were on there, like Brian Howe's on there, you know, Faye Masterson's on there. So it's like, not yeah. you know, totally yeah. fooling people. But it right. was fun to, it was fun to play at that anyway at first. And, uh, yeah, I'm happy to hear that that people that people saw the trailer in the in the movie theater, and um, and they thought uh, some of them thought, is that real? Is that really an old film? And that was that was cool, you know. Yeah. Mike, Schles- Mike Schlesinger yeah. of Sony cut that trailer. Who's now now, but he's not with Sony anymore. He's a, he's a good buddy, and he became producer on my other films. And um, he cut that trailer, put the music in that. I mean, just a, just a masterful trailer. I remember seeing the trailer it was the first introduction I had to to Lost Skeleton. And I remember I was like, I think my mom and I were watching something that we had rented either on Netflix or whatever. I don't remember what it was, but there was there was previews in front of the movie and there was a preview for Lost Skeleton. And I was like, 
what the hell is this movie? I'm like, this looks crazy. Like it, it looks like this old school movie, but it's, it looks zany and it looks funny. And I'm like, I, I have no idea. I've never heard of this. And, and so that was just like, you know, that was all I needed. It was like, okay, like, let's, let's, let's check this movie out. Um, and then, you know, only, only afterwards realizing truly how, how great it was, but that, that trailer was just like, it was kind of like out of left field, you know, it's like, that's not the trailer I expected to see in front of any movie I'm watching right <laughs> now. And that was just awesome. I was like, wow, yeah. I- I'm paying attention to this. Yeah. Like, yeah. It, was, it was great. Yeah. I mean, we, we, I think, so the three of us watched this movie for the first time together because uh, I was back probably around 2008 or so. And um, it was back in the days of uh disc only Netflix kids wow yeah. no streaming wow. yeah no, no streaming, streaming guys yeah, no streaming. uh this is back in the dinosaur days when we had circles to in hop the on our triceratops and go uh go to the mailbox and put the old netflix netflix envelope back in the in the mailbox i yeah, don't even remember back. that That's yeah so- you got to put oh, the yeah. stupid barcode the right way so it fits out the oh window. Oh, my God. I forgot the stupid barcode. Because oh <laughs> yeah. if you no, put it the wrong way, ass. then they wouldn't be able to scan it. And they're like, you never right. returned your movie. And we're like, yeah, I did. <laughs> yeah, I did. Yeah, I did, though. Um, but yeah, we saw it at the same time. This was a movie that I had uh, become aware of because of the Internet. So I hadn't seen the trailer on a movie like like uh, Tim did. But we... Uh, you know, it was just it was just on my radar. I'm like, this looks really funny. I love old black and white sci fi movies, of the, specifically of the 50s. And this just looked, you know, like my kind of thing. And it was, you know, very positively reviewed everywhere online. Like, you know, you still have a 7.0 on IMDb, which for IMDb is impressive. I mean, it's that's pretty good. Yeah. That's pretty good. So, um, you know, it, it just overall people loved this and I'm like, okay, this is, this is great. And I am just such a fan of parody. We are humongous Weird Al Yankovic fans, we, you know, to this day. And uh, just, I think he sort of put that between Weird Al and Mel Brooks, you know, I just, I just love yeah. parody so they much. They like definitely and, yeah. put parody into my brain. Like yeah. I don't think I really thought about it until those. Mm-hmm. those right. Two. And there are plenty of others, an airplane, certainly. And you know, there, there's lots of others that are great, but you know, I for me it was always about uh the term that I, I think I don't know if Weird Al coined this term or what, but I know that he uses it and that's style parody. And I definitely uh think that when something comes into that territory where it's it's like i'm gonna create something new in the style of something somebody else something else some you know he'll write a song that sounds like it was a pearl jam song but it wasn't a pearl jam song you know um and he does that all the time so i i mean that's one of the things that i love so much about your stuff is that you can oftentimes feel like all right it's it's not like i said it's it's not only a good parody it could almost be I mean, you're right. You're right, Tim. It, it is like a little too funny. Maybe you'd, you'd get that it was a comedy, but right. it's right. close. And there are scenes where it's just it's it's hitting all of the exact same ingredients that make the stew that you're parodying. And, and it's just it's just so exactly perfect. Um, like yeah. we were we were watching it last night. And uh, and I think at one point, Stephanie goes, she's she's like she's like, it's ri- it's ridiculous. But you could totally like hear them actually saying that in a movie like this i'm like yes yes like this dialogue is is so goofy and funny but also it's so like stilted and and the comedic timing is so perfect that Mm -hmm. she's like it takes such good actors to act this poorly with intent like have it be funny right and have it have it all land like that and so that like it it takes so much talent to really Mm -hmm. accomplish that level of like parody where it's like yeah. it's it's so bad it's good on purpose and that's just like it's yeah, phenomenal I, I think the key i think the key to that type of thing is to is to play it straight because if mm-hmm. you um if you if you overdo it at all um it, it's just not going to work i've seen it not work and um and i've seen it work but it, it, it i think it's just the straighter it's played the better uh, the the scenes in the beginning of Skeleton where they sh- where you show like you know three or four random squirrels like that that is stock footage right you didn't actually mm-hmm. capture footage yeah. of squirrels that's right 
That's, okay. Yeah, so that's that's one of the stock footage. It's repeated stock footage. The exact yeah. same shots are shown twice. <laughs> right. You, you, yeah. Right. You get like one, two, one, two. But, yeah. That, you know, so it's like. Yeah. That's one of the ingredients. It's like you have like yeah. what makes up the thing that I'm trying to make a style parody of. Mm -hmm. And as far as B picture shortcomings, like. I mean, you, you, you hit like everything. You got obvious stock footage. You got the use of night for day of uh, day for night, day for night, name dialogue that goes, that sounds like, you know, it was written by aliens or something. You got overacting, you got bad acting, you have cheaply made props, cheaply made costumes, insinuated action, insinuated cows. I love that insinuated monsters. And there's an insinuated cow, which may you're not first. bossy. You're not maybe, bossy. Bossy may be the, the first insinuated cow in film. I'm not. I'm not positive, but gosh, um, you make it sound so cheap. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I'm like, you're like all these cheaply made things. I'm like, I don't it's, know. It probably cost somebody something. Don't say there's well, no cow. We had a cow. You just couldn't see it. The cow was in the dark. The cow was bossy. not well lit. It was in oh. cut footage. <laughs> get it by the, you, get it by the lunch box to see it. You hit all of these things. And yeah, you mentioned the repeat footage. The uh, I remember on, I think on the commentary, you mentioned that there's like a, the shot of the skeleton sitting up in the cave is the same shot over and over every single time. Yes. Yes. Well, so yeah. Funny. Yeah. There's uh, the, the, <laughs> the well, maybe 80% 80 of the skeleton on screen is that same shot of him just lying. There. He's just lying there right. and not doing anything. That's about, that's gotta be about 80% of his acting right there. So. Right. So, you know, funny. he's, he's an efficient actor. The skeleton yeah. really likes to just do it right the first time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you don't have to work with him, pal. Let me tell you. <laughs> oh gosh, is he a? Is he a? He, he seems real ham. You know, yeah, real, real, you know, you real diva. Knock, you hurt your knuckles knocking on the fucking trailer door. Let me tell you. Like, okay, come on, Get we're on, up. we're on, we're on. On set. We got it. We got to shoot uh, now. Let's go. That is how lazy he is. <laughs> yeah, but he sleeps now. You yeah, can't interrupt does. that. See, that's the problem. He's always sleeping. Yeah, I say I say that all the time. I say it all the time. Like before I go to bed, I'm like, I sleep now. Peace. Just, yeah, that's, that's that's how I end my day. I sleep now. That that's <laughs> that's the one. Maybe I hear the there's 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 a there's a few lines that you hear people uh, use over and over, and so many fans uh, tell us that they these lines come to them all the time. They use them on a daily basis at yeah. home, and it's just yeah, uh, it's in the vernacular. You know? Yeah. Yeah, that, that, that sticks with people. It's really yeah, yeah. The, the I sleep now. That is how stupid you are. You know. I mean, there, there's right. definitely like. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think, I think the line of the movie for me, and and I know, I probably will change my mind like in a month, but, <laughs> I, I feel like maybe the most perfect line in this movie is uh, is the aliens us. Is that one of your Earth jokes? Yeah, yeah. That's like a. It's just flawless. <laughs> it's so it it really is so stupid. I mean, it's I, so simple. Uh, I I uh, I use the word stupid in a way that um, uh, we use that a lot when we're filming these things. You know, mm. we have some fun and we say, "Man, that was so stupid," and, <laughs> and we mean it in a good way, kind of the good stupid, just uh, um, you know, like it, like like someone using the word slowly over and over again you know see that's times. my what my scene. wife my wife will do the slowly thing <laughs> right slowly, slowly. <laughs> slowly. <laughs> um so you say stupid on that um i say that line is is a master class in comedy i mean it it is it is a very short line it it like starts out presenting like you know this outrage and then he gives away the farm by the <laughs> just, end of the sentence he just gives and it's it, it's i it's, mean it's, it's just it's yeah just it's sublime truly, it's truly like this perfect line and i know there are probably funnier parts but that 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 line to me is like just perfect yeah uh, it, that's a good it is a good line to sum up crowbar to sum up the aliens as a couple yes i think and why they're Oh, Subterfuge yeah. is so flawed, so <laughs> tragically <Right>. flawed in <laughs> every respect. They don't and, have a chance and, in and hell. And it carries over into into the second film, the second mm -hmm. Lost Skeleton too. They cannot 
they just cannot pretend as well as they really should. Right, right, right. Well, Joe, you had a good question about the aliens. Oh, yeah. So what does the what is Planet Marva? Like what does it consist of? Other than just being a planet with, you know. I have a theory. I'm dying. This is a great question. What from the mind of the man himself? What's Marva like? <laughs> it's um well, there are no messes. No messes. They gave Sound up like there's no eons nothing. ago. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, ago, yeah. Uh, I, th- I, th- I have a feeling that it's not too much different than um, the planet that Eros and Tana come from in uh, Plan 9 from Outer Space. Um, I, you know, I think it, but I think it's, it's, it's less militaristic, though, and, and, a, little, and a lot friendlier. Um, uh, because you know they're they're the crowbar and lattice were inspired by the the two aliens in Plan Nine. But, sure, but they really are more. There is a warmth to them. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, right. you know, even with their bickering and stuff, I think, and I, I imagine Marva is probably. Uh, and I, to tell you the truth, I've never really thought about this until you just thanks oh. thanks for making <laughs> me think <laughs> a lot. Um, Dad. I am. I I think now that I have to that it is a lot like the uh, you know you see those 1930s Popular Mechanics covers that show the future that never really happened with the yeah yeah, 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 yeah. everything is sidewalks and all that all that stuff that World's Fair happened. stuff. I think Marva is a lot like that. I mean, it's got all that stuff, all that stuff. Um, it's just it's just basically the 1920 so World's you know, Fair. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like the, the you know that's that future kitchen at the World's Fair where everything is done for you kind of thing. And yeah, and so and and that's why they expect doors to open up. You know, that's right. just the way it is. So. Right. The door scene. So oh my. I know God. you like, like that door scene. I love that. Door, yes. Like that door scene <laughs> is the funniest damn scene in that movie. Every so every scene with the two of them. Ab- Absolutely kills me. Yeah, they're, they're just I've seen this it's movie gold. so many times. Yeah, Bell, belly laughs like I can't stop. I can't hold it in. They like Andrew <laughs> Parks and and Susan McConnell just floor me. They kill me. They slay me. They got my number. The two of them. The 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 subtle expressions. And I've I know I think I think it's also on the DVD. But Andrew said that um, that he was playing two characters in that movie. He was not only playing crowbar he was playing a bad actor who was portraying crowbar and using it as like it was the greatest role he had ever gotten and then it's like this is his resume right like this this is is what he's gonna point this is his hamlet (laughs) this is uh this is this guy this unnamed actor who played crowbar this is his hamlet and uh and it's just thinking about it that way it is so fun and i don't know there are layers there are just layers to both of them and uh yeah the, the scene with the stairs like what is this uh it's a series of small buildings so you actually talked about this um on the on your facebook page do you want do you want to just the stairs, can I share yeah. that anecdote yeah. and before i do i just want to fit, touch on your what you said um and and because andy, andy and susan there's a, there's something also really adorable about them and and it's because we know we know that they are they landed here they're stranded they they're new they're they're going to try to fit in and so us knowing that they we we, i I think we we sympathize with them and and see them almost like children because they're going to do everything paul and betty do they're going to do what animala does at the dinner table so they're kind of it's a childlike uh right charm right just just pure charm to them i mean the scene yeah that i like i can think of too but th- that scene like you just alluded to where where they aren't sure who to emulate at the dinner table and animala goes first and they're just like okay this is what we do wham i'm like it's so goddamn funny like it's like oh no you guys you picked the worst possible person to emulate right now and this no they're like come oh, Gee, everyone's so hungry. <laughs> I was just gonna say, Brian Howe gets to deliver the uh, the coup de grace there. The, the uh, so how, how, how many takes? <laughs> how so many takes? How many takes? We had trouble with scene. it. You know, I think there are. I haven't looked at the outtakes in 
years now that are on the DVD, and there's not a whole lot of them because we were too we were shooting too lean. We didn't have the luxury to have too many outtakes. But but the mashed potatoes thing, Jen had trouble getting bringing her face up. <laughs> And like what? Great face, like, especially with the potatoes on the hanging on the end of her nose. Right, like when the doorbell rings or someone's at the door and she's like, Rrr, and it just goes right back. <laughs> it was right brutal. back to it. it. it I'm it like, really, how the hell? It was really hard. It was really hard to uh, uh, to keep a straight face for that. Uh, the stairs thing that uh, that Steve brought up was uh, we rented uh, uh, for the Lake Arrowhead. We shot it first at. Um, Ronson Canyon. Then we went up to Lake Arrowhead and we, we rented a, a couple of cabins and, um, and there was not a perfect cabin, meaning it looked just like the one that I pictured in my head when I wrote the script. So we used an exterior part of one exterior part of another one, of the other one. We were staying in the cabins, the, the cast and crew. These were good sized places. And, and we, we lived and we, we lived in, and, and ate there and everything. And, and that was cool. So, we got these two cabins, but they weren't quite perfect. And, and, um, and I did not expect there would be stairs. I just didn't picture that. So here's the aliens arriving at the cabin and they got to go up these stairs. And so I thought, well, what if um, rather than just having crowbar and lattice go up the stairs, I mean, it made sense to what if they don't have stairs, they've never seen stairs that not in millions of years on their planet. And so I, I wrote this, I scribbled down this ridiculous scene and on, a, on an envelope, I think, at first, then transcribed it to a better looking piece of paper. And, and um, Andy and uh, Susan, I t and I told them, uh, just, you know, make it like a disaster movie where you're on a, you think of it as a precipice. And so you got to, you know, really, and they flatten against the wall. And, and of course, yep. when, when, when Lattice teeters to one side, she makes yep. like, beep, 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 beep. <laughs> no, it's oddly related to Curly Howard in, in a way. Um, yee, 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 kind of thing, and yeah. and uh, it, it, it's just uh, they they uh, they were so good in that, and um, and and it was so nice to have that uh, scene that was not in the script. I mean, that's literally the only scene that is in the movie that was not in the script. Oh, just just them with the wow. stairs. Yeah. Huh. And then it was... and then they get get to the top, and they just absolutely lose their shit, and that like all of the. Uh, <laughs> Just in case we believe that they actually were cool and collected and smart and together and advanced and all that stuff, the fact that they fall to absolute pieces without even trying to open the damn door is like <laughs> the other part that I just die. I, I'm just, I can't even breathe. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, and, you know, it, it's, the, it's all the performance. Like, I mean, it's, yeah. it's, it's hilariously like, you know, the whole scenario is super and, funny. And, but And the key is yeah. to, to rev them up you want to rev them up so much that when Paul and Betty, who are a little clueless to begin with, open the door, they are like, at, you know, they are like all keyed up and ready and, and tense. Yeah. And, and, you know, uh, and uh, finally we go in, you know, it's like they're, you know, they come in with this arrogance now. Like, you know, <laughs> where, where is that coming from? And so it, it um, I, I just, I love comedy where uh, the people that don't, don't know what's going on can only kind of like just sort of stare blankly and often that's what it calls for betty and you'll see at the dinner table on, on the yeah. sofa paul and betty have absolutely uh just, this blank expressions they're just yeah, they're just glazed over like yeah I just which no which way. actually works and you know the crazier the stuff is going around them going on around them the uh the, the less they 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 register which which works for me so. I, I also it, like just in that door scene, I, I pointed this out last night um, to my girlfriend and I, I really appreciate it is like you very clearly see the stairs that they're going up in the door and then they reach the top and they're in a completely different porch. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like they're in like a nice big porch suddenly. Cabin one, and I'm cabin like, two. Cabin <laughs> I'm one, like, cabin two. Mm, <laughs> like, and that's the beauty of it. Like that stuff, the unsaid stuff that it's just like, if, if you're, if you're paying attention to those details, it's just right. adds such a richness to the, right. Like that's totally like one of the ingredients. I didn't mention that one, but that's another one, you know, just like stock footage and day for night and all that stuff. Like, you know, it's, it's a thing that happened a lot in those old movies where they yeah. would shoot different, um different locations and try to play off like it was the same place you right know, like you didn't notice not. right um, right 
<laughs> You're too busy eating your jujubes. You didn't even see it. <laughs> um, that that uh, specific thing is most hilariously exemplified in the 1980s classic Samurai Cop. I don't know if you've seen Samurai Cop or not, but uh, it's a favorite of mine. And, yeah. and uh, oh my God, I, I cannot think of another movie that does a worse job convincing the audience that two completely separate locations are the same room or the same <laughs> car even like the same interior of the car it's 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 chef's kiss so if you <laughs> if you haven't seen samurai cop larry i i, I would i have to keep an eye on that. I, I, I don't know that but, that's a good one um riff tracks did it too but the honestly you don't even need the riff tracks um so you mentioned Bronson Canyon a couple of times. Um, Bronson Canyon, for those of you who don't know, is a very legendary shooting location uh, used by dozens and dozens of B-movies and uh, even tel- television shows and everything like that. I have a short list here. Attack of the Crab Monsters, Invasion of the Body Snatchers, The Spider Had Conquered the World, The Brain from Planet Arouse, King Dinosaur, Invisible Invaders, Night of the Blood Beast, The Return of Dracula, Robot Monster. Oh, Robot Monster. Uh, you know, there's just like tons of them. Dozens and dozens. Uh, very famous location. Uh, but for those of you who might not know, uh, it, do you want to talk about the canyon? What it was like? Yeah, you know, it's, it's um, I had first, uh, I think I first went there in the 90s. And uh, when I was living in Massachusetts on an L.A. trip, a buddy of mine, uh, when I was out there, I said, you know, you got to see Bronson. Of course, I was ready because it was like hallowed ground. I mean, it just felt like, I mean, I, I, I'm not sure the first use of Bronson, but it had, I'm sure it was in the silent movies. Um, you know, I mean, John Wayne movies. I mean, there, it, it, movies, TV shows, countless, hundreds, hundreds shot in this. And it's really not, not a huge place, but but it's a stone's throw from the city. And yet, you don't look like you're in the city. It does have that feeling of, uh, of being out there. Uh, you've got the canyon, you've got the cave entrances. And of course, the cave entrances we use were on the inside of the canyon, whereas the bat cave entrance, where the Batmobile would go in in the old TV series, was on nice. the sort of the outside part, that one big tunnel there. And that, that tunnel has more of a... Um, uh, a shape that looks more like, you know, n- n- not natural. Whereas mm-hmm. the entrances we used uh, are small, were smaller and, and more uh, uh, natural looking, which, which worked for Cadaver Cave. Mm-hmm. Of course. And the very first shot was in Cadaver Cave. We <laughs> got there at 5 a.m., really cold, really cold, really dark. And we're in a cave. And then a little, looking at a little monitor in a cave, um, shooting the you know the the, the skeleton, and uh, that was that was very vivid. It was like, oh, we're really doing this. Wow. Okay. <laughs> Here we are. It's freezing out of the cave. I, I, I think uh, I think it might be on the commentary track um, when Bob DeVos said to me something like uh, how amazing it was to be in Bronson Canyon. He said I, I, I he said he just went to uh, he had just gone to take a leak, and he said, "I'll bet Robert Vaughn might have peed here." He was like, oh, wow, you know, it's <laughs> and, like you're you know, probably right. <laughs> you know, they shoot a Corman movie there. Uh, he was in Teenage Cave, man. He had to take a leak somewhere, and it was probably the same around the Bend area. You know, right? Sure. So, yeah, yeah. So, uh, but it, but it's, but it's a magical place, and it felt it cost us to be there. I think it was like three grand, which. Uh, which was wow. in our budget. That was a that was a lot of money, um, and three grand. I, I that sticks in my head because uh, at that time they didn't have a sliding scale. Um, little low budget, tiny movie like us comes in, big TV show or big ass movie comes in, charge the same thing. Three three after, grand, right? After that, they had a, more of a sliding scale, but it didn't matter because it was it was magical to use that place and it felt like we got to use it this is right you know so right yeah it just had to be it must have been it must have been just i mean to, i to to learn that that was your first day that you you started at the canyon is uh is so cool i mean you just said it like wow i guess we're doing this we're really doing this right here 
Um, that is just so incredibly fun. And yeah, I didn't, I didn't see, uh, I guess, I guess what I had looked up for, for the names didn't even mention the, uh, all those Westerns, but, uh, I did see some stuff referenced all the way going back to the early thirties. Um, so at least, at least that, that long. And, um, and, and, and it makes sense that, that it would be even earlier than that. Uh, I imagine, but, uh, so, you know, it'd be an interesting trivia question, which <laughs> I don't know the answer. <laughs> who, who, who was the very first show to, or movie or whatever it's to shoot, from, you know, that'd be a good trivia. I'll tell at you. Bronson mm-hmm. Canyon. Yeah. Neat. Yeah. I don't know. It's very, uh, it's super interesting. Really, really cool. Now. So in my head, I, I learned that today I learned that I was incorrect in this in my head, I always think, oh, Bronson Canyon, that's where uh, Kirk fought the Gorn in Arena. And that is not actually true. That's right. That was a totally different location. Um, it was uh, Vasquez Rocks, wasn't it? Wasn't it? I think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that sounds right. That sounds right. Yeah, it's, it's uh, so I don't know where that is exactly like that's, in relation to Bronson Canyon, but it's out that's there. Farther right? out. That's, that's, that's farther up. I I've actually ne- not been there, which it's an iconic place and I, I should, but, but it's actually, um, it's actually more a ways. Bronson Canyon is, I mean, you are, you're literally driving in Hollywood. You take a left and there's a, uh, there's a gate, like, you know, the gate, uh, like a railroad gate that goes up and down that kind of thing. And you, you, uh, when it's open, you just drive in, you pull into the park, and that's Griffith Park. And then you, you just walk up the road or drive up the road, if you've got a you know, permit, you drive up the road, and there's the canyon. So you got Griffith Park, which was also iconic for monster movies in the 50s. Uh, and, and, and really, I mean, it is, it's right in Hollywood. It's right in Hollywood. It's amazing. Hmm. I would love to see it someday. Um, yeah, I'd love, to, I'd love to see it. Uh, you know, I, I love that kind of stuff. And the history is just, it's, it's just so fascinating because, you know, you, you know, you, you just jokingly, you know, said, Oh, maybe that's where Robert Vaughn peed, but like, it's like, you're standing in the same place that so many people did. And, you know, if you like, if you like these kind of genres, it, it's just, it, there's a wealth of the same exact like hill and the same cave and the same that's so funny i i did not realize that was the exit for the batmobile but now i can picture it the, the cave and, and it had the uh you know the the road do not enter thing mm-hmm. and it would slap down flat and they would drive over it and they'd go back up and um that so that that's because i saw pictures of that cool. cave that circular cave mm-hmm so fascinating so fascinating i love i love this old hollywood stuff you know learning about all that um but yeah i mean i mean it's just it's just a great i i think that it's funny we kind of have talked about the movie and we we never really did did an intro this movie like what's this movie about larry uh it's it's kind of hard yeah like what what is this movie about this lost skeleton of cadavra you know this is because you lampoon everything you lampoon like all different types of movies you you know you you mentioned um you mentioned the aliens in plan nine you also have uh animala obviously looking quite a lot like the uh the catwoman of the moon um and then you know i i mean just the, the the dutiful 50s wife you have like all these great stock characters that are just so perfect and you put them together and made this crazy movie so so what was the genesis of this script like was it was it sort of like you wanted to write something so that you could go film and you had this you know your friends or you know however you assembled your troop was it sort of that leading the rest of the train and the script came later or did you have this this crazy script idea and it sort of was like aha let's just let's just film this thing it's it's going to be fun i i think what you're saying steve is what's up with this crazy lost skeleton of cadaver thing <laughs> and is it just a <laughs> passing fad with you larry um it it, it uh uh it well let's see it it uh it was written very quickly first of all uh i i I have five days in my head 
and uh, and I'm pretty sure that the first draft was in five was written in five days, um, and it it just just sort of came it just sort of all came out it all fit together, and uh, and I, I I a lot of it was stream of consciousness, but I can see that what I was doing was a kind of um, 1950s monster movie stew, where yeah. science fiction and yeah. horror come together, and of course. I mean, the mutant is a sci-fi thing. The skeleton is a horror thing, but it just kind of, it almost, it's almost like a duel of, you know, horror and sci-fi. And, uh, and so elements of both come in there. Um, I did not, you know, I was not thinking about um, specifically like getting my friends and making movie kind of thing. It was, it was more like, um, uh, uh, well, I remember one thing that that had uh, kind of sparked it was that I had read an article about digital filmmaking, which was sort of, it was access. It meant like, you know what? You don't need 35, you don't even need 16 millimeter film. This expense, you can make a movie a lot cheaper. And when I thought I could make a movie cheaper, I thought, well, what's a cheap movie? a low budget science fiction monster movie. So uh, so basically I poured out all this stuff that I had absorbed over the years uh, from the movies I grew up watching, the ones I still love. You know, I, 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 I love them as a kid, I still do. And, and, um, and, and I wanted to, to, to put them all in there. Uh, and there were certain specific influences the aliens were definitely influenced by uh, Eros Santana from Plan 9, but only as a takeoff point because then they took on a life of their own. It's yeah. Like inspiration is only a, a launching pad often. And uh, the same with Animala, who does resemble Catwoman of the Moon. I mean, that's the look, but she's her own creature. I mean, she just became, yeah. you know, very uh, special. And of course, uh, Paul and Betty were based on so many of the scientists and scientists' wives scientists wife wives of the uh, 50s um, they they uh, they filled that um, that niche and um, and I realized uh, that Betty uh, when uh, when I got around to casting and, and, and Faye Masterson was playing Betty I told her that I you know really I think a lot of Betty was inspired by the daughter in uh, Giant of the Unknown which, oh my God! Which, yes, uh, and 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 played by Sally Fraser and um, Tom Weaver, who has written millions of books on and these things uh, on on fifties monster movies and beyond. And uh, he he had interviewed Sally Fraser, and he told Sally Fraser that she was an inspiration for Betty, and she was delighted to hear that, and Faye was really delighted that she got to hear that. So I, I thought that was that was a really neat thing, and uh, uh, awesome. because. Because she really, yeah, and, and Faye really uh, uh, did capture uh, what Sally Fraser was doing in Giant of the Unknown. Um, She's perfect. She's so good. I know Joe. Yeah. Joe. Joe's a, a big fan of Faye in that movie. Yeah. Uh -huh. We're just talking yeah. about that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, the uh, the elements came together, and um, and and I wanted uh, I wanted a movie where all these sort of things converge. Mm -hmm. People and things, and, and how do they converge? Well, they're all after the same thing, even though skeleton, it's atmospheric. Yeah. Everyone, everyone needs that MacGuffin. Yes. And so yep. that is really a catalyst for, for comedy and, uh, and these you know, comic interactions and, and um, uh, people, different people, different characters not knowing what, what's going on with the other characters, you know. Uh, so, yeah, it, uh, that's how it kind of came together. And when when I, I had talked to uh, Miguel Valenti, my uh, friend who was a, 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 a working in film as a producer, and um, said, "You know, can we make this? Can we make this movie?" And um, and he said, "Why not?" So let's do it. And we, you know, and then I reached out to people that I already knew because uh, I already had worked with a lot, knew a lot of actors, a lot of my friends. And when Brian Howe came in, Brian started connecting people. He brought in Faye, and. Uh, it was actually the second choice, but uh, 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 but it worked out great. And Crowbar, 
uh, Sam Robards was the original crowbar, but he had to he he got a, a Spielberg gig, so he gave him a lot of shit about that. You know, oh sure, you <laughs> Spielberg. Wow. Right? Wait, I, I missed the name. Who 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 did you say was the original? Sam, uh, Sam Robards. He was the original crowbar, and so Brian House said, well, "You know what, my friend Andy Parks." And Andy came in. And he was, it was just, it was kismet, you know. Um, so, uh, and Susan McConnell, I knew from from Boston, and Bob DeVoe from Boston, you know, doing theater. They were good good friends, and and then it all came together like that. So, the end. Wow, absolutely awesome. I mean, yeah. the, the the troop is the the Blamire troop is just. It's just amazing, you know, yeah. and I love, I love a good troop, you know, going back to Mel Brooks, going back to Monty Python. Also Christopher Guest, you know, one of my favorite troops, oh, yeah. uh, his, his people, uh, the best in show folks. And I mean, you know, you, you guys are, you guys are right up there and uh, you, you do have the distinction of being on my favorite comedy shelf, like my DVDs. It, it's literally all those. It's all the Mel's, it's Mel Brooks, Monty Python, and then, Larry so like that just that's that's nice. up there I'm just saying it's just yeah I'm so honored, like, I'm honored you made there. the cut Larry no, you're I mean, on the best show I'm, oh, I'm in the top saying. three it's a I'm major just, award I'm, <laughs> I'm humbled just, I'm humbled I'm, I'm honored it's, that's, it's that's just amazing. it's just the best um but yeah the troop the troop is something that I've always um I do think Mel Brooks probably was the first time I noticed it where it's like oh it's a lot of the same actors it's not you know and he of course didn't always use the exact same uh, people, but you know, you have your Madeline Kahn and it's always great to see Madeline Kahn. Always great to see Gene Wilder. Always great to see like certain people. So you have these just absolutely awesome, awesome people that are, that are, you mentioned everybody. I think um, the one who came in after the first skeleton that I adore is Alison Martin. Um, and she of course is in, is in, I think all of the other ones, uh, so yes. at least. Of, yes. of She's the in Tales, and, and Tales from the Pub, uh, Screaming Forehead. Yeah. As Millie Healy and uh, uh, and of course Chinfa in uh, Lost Girl to Returns Again, and she's also uh, in Dark and Stormy Night as, as Miss Cup Cupboard. Yep, Mrs. Cup Cupboard. <laughs> yes. Oh, yep. oh my God, I love Miss Cup Cupboard when she goes nuts at the dinner table, man. Oh my God, I just lose it. Uh, we just let her go. We just let Allison go. Force of nature. <laughs> And you know, and Jennifer Blair and uh, Danny Roebuck are uh, phenomenal in that. I, they they worked really hard on their 1930s reporters to get that snappy patter down, really fast mm -hmm. back and forth. They're like, "Hey, you, you all, wait, I don't know about that." Oh, wow, um, like yeah, they're, they're really good at it. They're, yeah, uh, yeah. That I mean, Dark and Stormy is uh, is actually my second favorite of your films. I just I just love love dark and stormy night. but i mean to be fair i love old dark house movies so freaking much that mm -hmm. you know it's sort of like i just love what you're parodying and and it's again it's that same sort of thing where you're picking out different references and uh, uh it's yeah. it's fun but I, I i have to say real quick though the fact that you mentioned uh giant from the unknown is is so gratifying to me personally because i i have always felt that that one in particular because you do see certain things we're mentioning the aliens the catwoman look like just launching points like you said like you know okay you took some basic um inspiration from these and then you molded it into something else but there's something about giant from the unknown and i really the first time i ever saw it was uh probably six or seven years ago and um I, I don't know. There was all these, all these bells going off, all these flags. I'm like skeleton, skeleton. Ske I don't know. I just really felt like that particular in particular. And for uh, uh, Joe and uh, Tim, you guys, I know haven't seen this movie. It is a movie about a giant conquistador that is um, uh, just unearthed by like a, a random, like heavy rain. And he thaws out and he's been he was sleeping only lightly like buried. <laughs> sleeping for a few hundred years or something and he's he's just this giant conquistador i you know i'd really like to see him fight richard keel and ega i would like to see them really really just kind of <laughs> death battle right like um, go for it man you guys are cut from the same cloth but that's a that is a good one so the fact that you really based betty on the character from that is just amazingly cool yeah, she. I would say that she was heavily inspired by by that character. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, it's, awesome. and that's a fun movie. And and you know what? And the, what else, what what that movie also has that, and I think it was subconscious really because I, when I was writing Skeleton, um, you know, it it begins with so much talk about a dangerous place, a bad place, bad geography, um, skeleton cave. You know, the farmer, mm-hmm. the farmer is a li- you know a, li- a litany of of, of oh, past the devil's now. quadrangle. Yeah, yeah, just turn back now because you know path of staring skulls and everything and you don't believe the old legends and stuff and watching after that watching giant from the unknown again i uh i realized that there's there they do a lot of that talk about the devil's something the devil's crag is it i think in that movie um but it's about you know again it's a bad place a bad yeah that was probably that was a bell that probably went off which yeah yeah and which 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 always appeals to me even my my horror westerns that 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 idea of of a bad place um, a cursed ground or something. The Calamo Mountains are such a place. It's, it's, that's that's yeah. So that must have a real appeal to me. I think. Right. Yeah, the, there's something the place wrong of with danger. That. Right. Don't you know? None none shall pass through here. You know, yeah. It's like oh well. I want right. to know why. I want to see what's <laughs> in there. Yeah. So um, I, I've always kind of wondered: was uh, the farmer kind of a little bit based on Torgo from Manos Hands of Fate? I don't think I had seen that. I don't think I, I, I think I saw Manos in the 2000s. Um, that was not a movie I was familiar with until uh, I saw it on MST. And yeah, uh, no one was. <laughs> in probably the 2000s. And, uh, um, and no. Uh, um, it I think really if you put them up next to each other, they're, they're, they're eerily sort of a little similar. Well, it, it it was skeleton was entirely like fifties based. Everything for me had to be fifties based. I mean, right. Drawn anything eighties? When was it? When was that made? Eighties? Sixties. Uh, Manos. Manos. Sixties. Um, I want to say it's older than that. Nineteen sixty six. Oh, okay. Oh, is it really? Okay, I don't know why I thought it was a older later then. movie, but anyway, it. Uh, no, I hadn't seen it, and. Um, uh, really, the farmer's the guy, you know, like at the beginning of the blob, the old guy who's is curious about that. What is that stuff? And then the blob runs up the stick and onto his arm. Sure. And he's like the first victim. And and the first victim is always that kind of guy, you know. And, uh, so that's what he that's what he does in this. Right. Maybe walks a little too close to danger just because he's like, you know, doesn't realize it's there. Is a little curious about it and just gets it over his head and. Yeah. Well, you know, he's he's a he's a. It just cracks me up that everybody sees that guy and and says farmer because he doesn't read as a farmer, (laughs) and he's not near any sort of a farm. He's just sort of standing on the road. It's all (laughs) just so funny. There's so many layers to the comedy that make me love it so much. And um, and I don't know. I mean, like all the all the scenes. You you can't take any of the scenes out of out of this film there it, it is soup it's just stew like you said it, like but all the little pieces make it what it is and it's just so great um so all right so so skeleton guys do you do you have anything else on the first movie or um just anything you want to bring up on the first movie um, so there was there was a there was a credit that I saw that that actually Stephanie had seen uh, when we when we finished the movie, and it was for like the skeleton. You had a very like funny way of putting it, like the skeleton puppet articulation. Skeleton crew. manipulation. Yeah, the skeleton oh, manipulation, yeah. and so and so there was a another Blamire there. Is that is that? Oh, Corey, that's Corey. Yeah. In fact, in the photos that uh, you can see him uh, a number of times in the photos uh that uh i was showing on the uh, i was posting on, on facebook of the making of because he was involved in every aspect and he came out to uh, he came out to la and um suddenly he's boom operator and he's um never done that before uh but our sound man did not have a boom operator and he was often doing it himself so there's Corey learning the boom and he did it he, he did a, a, a good job of doing that and then he's uh, skeletal manipulation, which is basically uh, where, uh, well, a simple thing like he's, the skeleton's in the throne and the 
the hand goes up and he points. Right. <laughs> well, that needed to someone to pull. Someone on had to manipulate him. Built the filament, yeah. and uh, inside the cave, when he rises, you know that's that mm-hmm. that's filament there, and um, uh, and Corey uh, also stepped in when Darren Reed was not available at Lake Arrowhead. Uh, and we needed the mutant. Corey donned the mutant costume and and did a great okay. job. Um, uh, he had his own style of using the fingers. Uh, yes. Oh, the, yeah. the fingers. Yeah. 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 What's yeah. funny is that the fingers thing is it really resonates with me because when I was a baby, I used to do that. I had like this <laughs> weird thing, and so I see the the mutant doing that, and I'm like, I just it's it's me. It's part <laughs> you're part mutant. I know. That's what it is. I know. I am. I and am he, part, yeah, am. that's that's when um, the he uh, the mutant backs off. That's when yep. it's clear that he won't. He doesn't want to harm Betty. Right. He's right. Got a crush on her. He's got a crush on her. The, sweet uh, the old sweetie. Um, and so, uh, uh, um, yeah. So Corey was just he was a workhorse on this. He was great. That's that's awesome. So I mean, is he is he your Son is how I mean, how is he related yes. to you? Yes, your son. Yeah, yeah, I, I mean, know. yeah, so th- that was I really thought, cool to see I, that. I thought you were gonna, uh, I actually thought you were gonna mention the credit name on the credits, Joey Sack of Donuts. <laughs> <laughs> I've Who never thought, even seen Joey Sack of Donuts. Really, he built the rocket ship <laughs> set, the uh, the rocket ship that uh, uh, the crowbar, has, crowbar. Uh, <laughs> not the not the toilet paper tube that that is the the model in the miniature. But, but the, the actual, actual door they walk out of with the oh by the way Corey, oh. Corey was working the door on the rocket ship for them too no ah, kidding. Uh, no kidding. Okay. just plywood okay. so the poor guy I mean it's plywood so you got to like open that really and it's scraping and it's that was tough but anyway Joey Sack of Donuts is the guy that built that rocket ship and that was actually Ranger Brad himself that was Dan Conway no kidding ah. so he just used a fun fake name for that one. Yeah, I that's don't know where awesome. he came up with Joey Sack of Donuts. So I, yeah. that's an excellent. I, to, I knew a guy. Is, does Joey, I, I does knew a Joey guy Sack who knew a guy. I knew a guy who knew a guy, and I swear his name was Joey Sack of Donuts. Remember that guy? I, I, I don't know. Oh, I, I remember that guy. Out. That guy used to. Yeah, you remember that guy? Right? Who was that guy? Who was that? Yeah, that guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, we, we got uh, that guy. He built that rocket ship for us. Yeah, so I think his cousin's a statey. I think yeah. his cousin's a statey. He's yeah, my I brother's roommate's, yeah, yeah. you know, cousin's, uh, you know, dog sitter. Yeah. That's Joey Snails. Joey Snails. No, oh, no, that's no, Joey no, Snails. No, I'm thinking the wrong Snails. guy. Wrong guy. Ah, the wrong yeah, Joey. Yeah, that, that's awesome. Good, um, good, good stuff. Actually, there there was something else I was thinking about, too, which as far as the music. So you were saying that, um, you know, the soundtrack for this movie, was was this all pulled from kind of like a public domain music or, or, or explain the music to oh, me because I feel like uh, the, I feel like it fits the movie so well. Yeah, I haven't. I don't use. Uh, I haven't used public domain music. It's the first film, Lost Girl and Cadaver, uses the. Uh, I had. Uh, I was familiar with some of the music from because I love soundtrack music and I love library production music. So Valentino production music in New York. Um, I told him I was interested, and if I could, you know, and I asked if I could, you know, get a deal for the picture. They gave me a, <clears throat> excuse me, a great deal and sent me out a whole bunch of CDs. And that was a, just, man, I was just in heaven going through those. And that, yeah, that's for that scene. That's for that scene and so on. And then when, uh, when, I, when it t- came time for Screaming Forehead, I wanted a different sound. And I was familiar with the DeWolf Library from Monty Python and the Holy Grail. Okay. Oh. When I saw that movie, I thought, I love the music they're using. And said music by DeWolf. And I thought, whoever this composer is with one name like Cher, that's he's really good. No, <laughs> DeWolf was a production music library. There's all these different composers. So I used DeWolf on that. And then when we did Lost Girl to Returns again, I wanted yet a different sound. And I was sampling some music uh, with, uh, through uh, David Schechter of Monstrous Movie Music, who puts out phenomenal monster movie CD soundtracks. And he had samples on there by uh, Joe Morgan and um, uh, John Morgan, excuse me, John Morgan and Joe Morgan's a Red Sox manager from years ago. Uh, <laughs> John, John Morgan and William Stromberg. And um, their, a lot of their music is very Bernard Herman esque, kind of like like from the Harryhausen uh, movies like Jason and the Argonauts and Seven Voyages of Sinbad has mm-hmm. a lot of that flavor. And yep. since 
Lost Gone Returns again was going to be sort of a jungle, right? Such jungle an adventure, adventure with monsters. Like, yeah. Right. Yet again, I wanted a different sound. I I managed to get a great deal with those guys who were they're great guys, and um, there's a soundtrack. We put out a soundtrack to it, actually, which is oh, for, for the Skeleton Returns. For, returns again. For, Skeleton Returns again has a soundtrack out, and um, but nice. their music again that was a different a different flavor, and and I loved it. Now when it came time for Dark and Stormy Night. That was my first original score. Okay. Although uh, Christopher Caliendo, who wrote the Dark and Stormy Midnight score, had orchestrated the theme song to Trail of Screaming Forehead already. Okay. Okay. I wrote, wow. I wrote the theme song to that movie. He orchestrated it and got, uh, and, and, and we worked, we recorded with Manhattan Transfer and recorded that title song. And, Oh right, yeah, sure. Uh, that was a beautiful. Trail beautiful. of the scream, screaming forehead. Yeah, it was. It's such a romantic and, and oh, like, it's beautiful. Song. Um, oh yeah. But, but Christopher composed what was my first really original score, and that was Dark and Stormy Night. Um, and it's only there's only about fifteen to twenty minutes of music in the whole movie. But the old Dark House movies notoriously did not have a lot of. Music. Right. Right. It's just right, right. you had the, like the stings, and you had like certain, uh, you know, something's happening. Music. Right. Um, that's that's awesome. That's that's super interesting to, to to hear. I mean, I just I the the music that plays when the skeleton is walking and kind of doing his thing. It's like the the those that that piece of music fits so perfectly with yeah. the skeleton's motions, and it's just got this yeah. kind of like spooky bombast to it and it's yeah. like he's just kind of like trotting along doing his his ridiculous walk and uh, see again in my head all i can come up with is the torgo theme when i know and i know it's sort of similar it has that like bump 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 there's bump, a torgo bump. theme really in oh what? sure every yeah well every time every time torgo walks oh okay in um in manos he it's just it's just yeah. literally it's less notes than john carpenter uses it's i think <laughs> i think it's just literally three notes yeah, the yeah. no, this the skeleton is like the dun 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 dun. dun oh yeah, dun, 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 dun. yes, yes. The 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 um the interesting thing is that some of those cues like that, and some of the ones in Screaming Forehead, uh, those aggressive marching kind of cues like that were used for were really used mostly in industrial films, like oh okay. okay. Here, you know, here the barrels are pounded into, the, 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 you know. Right, and, like your How It's and, Made videos of like, okay, you know, this is just a safety dun, 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 You know, it's it's industry on the march kind of thing, which was perfect yeah. for, you know, the stupid skeleton. So. That's, it's, it's perfect if you got to keep your jam handy. <laughs> got to keep hey. your jam handy. It's <laughs> the deep sky. Jam handy. <laughs> awesome, um, yeah, I mean that 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 is really really cool. But I so I I didn't know a lot of that uh, actually. That's really interesting. I hope people found that interesting. But the the reason why the movie you know sounds so authentic is because the music is literally authentic music that was used in all these old movies and stuff. It's like yeah. so cool. You know, we don't we don't know that's how stuff is. We don't know how the sausage is made over here in uh, Massachusetts. <laughs> right, it's just uh, sausage. <laughs> We're just happy to have it. Yeah. I mean, sometimes we have it with corn. Um, sometimes we uh, make a corn. sandwich with it, and we say shabiban, and then we uh, we uh, we have ourselves a little sit. That's, that's ourselves a sit do. and a watch. It's, <laughs> it's not really much to do here uh, if you're not a a, a a sports ball fan, uh, which I know it's impossible to think of such a thing, right? A combination of non-sports fans and people living in Massachusetts. We're we're freaks, Larry. We're freaks. <laughs> Don't look at us! Oh my, uh, we have eyes. to we, we have we have to fight them off. You know, we have to say, you know, everyone who's coming at us talking to us about the the score, we're just like, eh, I don't, I don't, I don't know nothing about that. I'm too busy making these great podcasts. You wouldn't understand. <laughs> well, I, great. I guess, okay, yes, so I did the I'm... hand motion too. Yeah. Yeah. I guess, yeah. You have a skeleton <laughs> manipulator just now, Tim. Yeah, yeah. Corey's here with me, actually. No. I, I, I was going to ask you guys what happened with the socks this year, but now I'm forget it. I'm not going to ask you now. Yeah, I don't know. The only socks I know about are the ones that have too many holes and I got to throw them out, throw them away. And my wife's like, why are you keeping those socks around? And I'm like, I don't know. They're perfectly good. They're I got a hell of a pair <laughs> yeah, of fuzzy socks. That's good. <laughs> I mean, my, my big toe sticks out of one of them, but like, whatever. <laughs> the rest of my toes are warm. So like, whatever, kid, it's fine. 
good. See, I just I just want to like that. That's that is uh that's that's uh, friend etch a gloss from a uh, message from the beyond. Right, and right, my, right. My, yeah, my, that's my, yeah, my that's your etch a gloss. Stirpy, Stirpy, Stirpy long. <laughs> That's a, that that name was written to be said in the Massachusetts language. It, it has to be. Accent. It has to be. Sturpy. Sturpy Lognuda. Sturpy. And I do really appreciate <laughs> Brian Howe's accent in that too. It's it's, it's really funny. His, his 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 performance in that is so unbelievably understated. That's what's so great about Brian is he will do anything you tell him to do, and he does it perfectly no matter what it is. His his performance in, um. In dark and stormy, as uh, what, what's his name, Burling Famish, Burling Famish Jr., this freakishly cold, <laughs> low lip. like, my oh pristy. my god, my pristy, my, my pristy, pristy. pristy. Well, that like, was written, oh that was written for his voice. I mean, it really was. I, I knew Brian did that character, he just he would just start doing that. I wasn't, you know, I don't even know what it came from. But I said, Brian, I wrote this for that voice you do. And there you oh go. Oh, my God. <laughs> nice. So funny. He is, I made this he for is, you. He is so funny in that movie. And and so is Faye. The, the two of them. The two of them are just perfect. The way she just, you know, Sebastian Fanmore. A, another amazing name. I love how you, in this movie, like, you have names that are so close to being real names. You just, like, right, tweak it with right. the hair. And See, that's absurd. the that's the that's the trick. And um, if if you if you arrange your syllables and, and, and your consonants and everything in a, in a certain pleasing way, it can sound like oh yeah, in another universe that is a real name because that is a real like Sebastian. Um, the, the, the 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 thing uh, that that's amusing is that with Dark and Stormy Night and with um, and with Screaming Forehead, the legal clearance was a piece of cake because. You look up those names, you can't find any of them. The only one we had trouble with in Dark and Stormy Night, Clarence had trouble with uh, Happy Happy Codburn. Okay. Uh, Dan Conroy. Uh, yeah, Dan's character, because there really was a, they found somewhere in the country an actual Happy Codburn. <laughs> and so... Um, <laughs> And so that that was one that uh, that I had to switch. No, it was no, no, no. Wait, wait, wait a minute. Now I'm, I'm, I'm. What is the actual? What is the name? I think it's Happy no. Codburn. I think it's. I think it's. Well, uh, I started out with um, Happy Happy Codburn. What was it? Um, it was something very similar to that, and I had to change it to Happy Codburn. Uh, because there actually was one. If only you had skills to slightly fuck with names and make new names out of them. <laughs> if only! Damn it! Ah, it's such a rare but, <laughs> you know, powerful skill. Was it like Happy Coburn or something? Like, I mean, just something like so so almost the same? Oh, I know. Codburn and Cogburn. So it was a D and a G. Oh, oh Codberg. That was the difference. Codburn and Cogburn. Okay. Oh, Cogburn. C-O-D and C-O-D. Yeah, so, so I think uh, it became a D. That was the yeah, only change yeah. I had to make because there was no, there was no uh, Sebastian Fanmore, and there was no Burling, Cupcupboard or Burling Famish. So Burling uh, those were all Junior. Yeah, that that's such an interesting loophole that you have that you have also found. You know, like by 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 having that be part of yeah. your your style, it also makes yeah. the legal part of it really quite easy because mm. because it's just all wacky <laughs> and you don't have to worry about it. You know, and never even names, think about that. Some of the names also back to the just now we're on names again. So I just am now just gushing about more names that are just <laughs> ridiculous. But in in Lost Skeleton Returns again, uh, some of my favorites are in this one too. Reet Pappen. Reet Pappen. I just want to say that all the Reet. time. Reet Pappen. Reet. What? Reet Pappen. Reet Pappen. And, and I, I do think the key is, because I have so much fun with the names, and I think, um, I really think if you can make it sound like, like it exists, like it should exist, um, it, it should have a pleasing quality to it, I think. You know? mm-hmm. Which is why you want to say it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's... Pappen. it's it's, it's it's so true and then you really i think with this one you really because again like the first skeleton was not so ridiculous you had paul armstrong betty armstrong you had 
you know, the aliens had silly names, but other than that, like everybody kind of has just normal, like Roger Fleming, you know, nothing's crazy. Um, and then with, with this one, I feel like you tried to, you, it was, you took it as a challenge. You like almost wanted to trip <laughs> up all your actors to see like, are they going to be able to say Gromanopodon and bent to vegetantis and like, <laughs> probably not. Like, can, uh-huh. can I throw another couple syllables and bent to vegetantis? Like, yes but should i maybe not am i wrong on that or was that uh was this just no 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 in fact you know my cast gives me shit about that because you know when i was i remember having the in law sculpture returns again when uh, faye uh is betty and she discovers me in the corner of a you know miserable bar and uh in the jungle and and um and uh i would and we're having a scene there and i i and 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 I I'm fumbling with my lines, right? And 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 she and she was giving me shit about see, see, see what you have make us do, see what you make us do. Yeah. It's like <laughs> that monologue, that monologue is so excellent. You made the entire second trailer just that monologue and it it works. It's just amazing. It's just you and your darkness. Oh, the bitter speech. The bitter yeah, the bitter, speech. yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That was fun. That was fun. Yeah. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's it's a long shot too. It's a lot to remember. It's uh, did you were you looking at cue cards or did you did you memorize that? No, that one I had memorized. And everyone oh. thinks everyone thinks you wrote the lines. You don't have to memorize it. You wrote them, right? But no, that's, that's bullshit. You have to you have to memorize them. Oh yeah, yeah. And, I mean, you know, especially with the sheer volume of random shit that I think of. I mean, you know. <laughs> You think I remember every random crappy thing I thought of, let alone <laughs> things I'm supposed to remember? No. Yeah, that, I don't remember. That, that scene's just just so freaking hilarious. I just love it. Uh, it. It is like, oh man, what happened to Paul? He was so happy all the time, and Betty's still there, and uh, it's a it's a great sequel. But um, anyway, like so, yeah, you know, I mean, it's they're all they're all great flicks. I definitely think that people should check them out, especially if they are fans of parody just in general these are these are maybe a little bit below your radar and uh you haven't maybe heard of them before if you haven't uh lost skeleton well you the lost skeleton of cadaver is where you start and then the lost skeleton returns again dark and stormy night is lampooning old spooky house movies and of course i mean what what do you even say about trail of the screaming forehead it's 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 color it's very vibrant it's it's different yeah and when i finished um Lost Skeleton, I wanted to do something kind of similar, but but a bit different. I wanted, and, and now it was like, okay, now it's an alien invasion, the like kind where- Body snatchers, um, kind of- Subversive, yeah, yeah. The subversive takeover mm-hmm. uh, where, you know, in a small town setting, gradually there people are being taken over and you've got these heroes who come in. Uh, by the way, um, Big Dan Freighter, and of course, we you, you meant you showed one of the CDs. We've got two of them out, and now uh, those are di- digital. I want to mention that those are now on uh, iTunes and Amazon. They're available digital. Oh, nice! So, that's awesome. Um, that's a good thing uh, to to get out there. And um, but Big Dan and Dutch and Millie are uh, are the uh, the heroes of of that. And uh, uh, instead of the you know the black and white thing, I wanted a widescreen now with candy color early 60s candy color popping from the screen yeah um very different look and feel and uh um uh i was uh, i was very happy with the way that one came out yeah it's it's great it's it's really really funny and uh you know again it comes down to the performances of of your troop or you know and you you put them in a blender every time you know they're never playing the same type of character yeah. ever um and and I was just so happy as a fan of of the two aliens. I was so happy to see Andy uh, get to be the hero, basically yeah. of the movie, the tragic hero of the movie. Tragic. It is a tragedy. It is. Yeah. It's a, it's a tragedy. Yeah. 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 Um, and he's just he's just so great at all times. And um, I mean, that- it's a wonderful. It's my favorite Andy performance. I think. I mean, him him in the the forehead makeup. I mean, it looks heavy. Like, like, was he encumbered by the prosthetic? The you know? It's not, it's, it, it, it wasn't heavy. I mean, it okay. was very strange. I'm sure I know it was strange for him and, you know, he couldn't, you know, he couldn't put a cell phone to his ear, but, uh, <laughs> uh, it, uh, 
it I don't but I don't believe it was it was heavy so it wasn't like a yeah, it, it like it's. I mean, it's such it is such a large, you know, face prosthetic, and it looks mm -hmm. so great. But yeah, you know, it's like I always feel like he, yeah. you know, it, it looks like the uh, like the stone like samurai statues where like the the big hair that kind of comes down on the side, and it just feels like it would be so weighty. But yeah, um, yeah that's that's pretty cool. Uh, there's a scene with the skeleton. He's doing the the, the hand motion, uh, controlling the the two the two aliens and. Uh, <laughs> You can't make aliens dance. You can't make aliens dance. Um, in the scene where he's doing the, the choreography, you see uh, hands controlling the arms, like off to the side of the screen. So that's Corey. Mm -hmm. That's Corey. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So is that was that intentional, like keeping the the, the hands in there, moving? The oh no, we would never do that. <laughs> <laughs> it must have been a mistake. Um, you know. Oops. Uh, where, where there are certain things that slip out even if you don't want them to and and certain things that were intentional i mean the the skeleton climbing down the rocks we knew that would look um, uh pretty awful and it did and uh, yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> um uh the door when uh the, the 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 rocket ship door has trouble closing yeah mm -hmm. yeah yeah, yep. that wasn't planned. I mean, there's <laughs> stuff that, that, that we call let's call them happy accidents. Happy I guess. Accidents. Yeah, 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 yeah. Call those happy cod burns. You know, just uh, <laughs> it's fine. It's cod burn. No, it's cod burn. Cog, cog burn. Cog. Stop. You're both right. Yeah. Oh man, <laughs> awesome stuff. Awesome stuff. So, yeah. um, I I want to definitely give you one more chance to just shout out about the Kickstarter, which is live today. Before we do that, we do have, um, we had one comment from our fans from the Retroids, George O'Connor, our buddy, who uh, he actually is a writer of his own, his own comics. He does homeless comics as his company. He's an awesome, talented dude, makes good stuff. George, a little shout out to homeless comics for George. George O'Connor says, I would just love to know what his headspace is when he's writing. These are so lovingly crafted and ridiculous, but could go wrong so easily. <laughs> Does he have a philosophy or a North star for making good, bad things? And he also adds that seeing Cadavera in a theater and having no idea what it was going to be about is still one of his all time favorite movie going experiences. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for that. George, is it? Yes. yes. Yep. Thank you, George. I appreciate that. And I, um, I can only say, I don't know if I have an answer to that question, though. I, I, I would say that I, I write things that I want to see, which sounds, maybe that's kind of obvious. Um, I write for me as an audience, I think. And, uh, and, and that helps, maybe that helps me kind of walk the line between going too far and playing it straight. And um, going too far and writing a fourth blamery terms book, you mean? That... <laughs> i think that's going too far there's nothing like, wrong with that i'm just reach too far <laughs> oh god you think i only have four i only have three i have four that are unwritten <laughs> but you just kind of write what you feel like and yeah, yeah i mean i think i think well, I, you know you get in that you know what it's like steve you get in the zone and you're just and it's it's uh you can feel it, you know, you can just tell it's like, it's like it's flowing. And, um, uh, and the best writing is for me, when I feel like I'm being dictated to, uh, it, it's create creativity is, is, uh, it's, it's a really odd, mysterious thing. I mean, I don't understand it. So I just don't question it and, uh, and feel like sometimes I'm taking dictation, you know, and it's weird. So. Yeah, sure. I think you're talking about like um, a lot of people have said, you know, the, the characters, uh, I wanted to do this, but the characters wanted to do something else. Sure. You know, the characters write themselves after a while. And it is, it is, uh, it is, it is a weird thing. I have experienced it. Uh, I have, you know, uh, tried to kill a character off and realized that I couldn't do it. Not because I felt like bad or anything or, anything like that it's just like no that's not what this character would do right if it, it that that doesn't feel right at all it doesn't seem like they would do that that that's mm -hmm. stupid they they have proven to me that they're not that stupid right. so they wouldn't behave that way they wouldn't do right. that and then it just feels disingenuous and like you're forcing it or whatever um so 
it is it is truly a weird thing and it's almost like a, a cliched thing to say as a writer that you know the characters write themselves after a while but it's true for everybody everybody who writes it's it's mm-hmm. weird yeah. it's you yeah. said i don't understand it yeah i don't know it's just weird yeah. but i i think it's a sign of of good writing because it means you're you're making a consistent you the character who doesn't exist yeah. is making consistent decisions and doing certain behaviors that are consistent with what they've previously done and if it all gels then yeah it all gels it's it's better yeah you don't want somebody to feel like they're all over the place and and when they are it tends to be something people complain about Mm -hmm. like oh or like you'll you know the classic is uh you have a a tv show that one that runs a long time and then you know, the showrunner will change. And then, you know, they have the character do something that as a fan, you go, there is no way that that character in a million years would have gone off to Paris and married this other random person. There's no way that would have happened. Mm-hmm. Like, what? Right. You, know. you gotta like keep them kind of aligned with whatever their, you know, that character's kind of, you know, modus operandi mission statement just who they are and it when when you when you have a character that really thinks and feels and acts in a way that makes sense to them and not necessarily servicing the story it just lends like that really realism and and gives them kind of this genuine quality which is just like you know even in the presence of of you know extreme you know zany comedy that still creates you know believable characters because they're just being themselves and that mm-hmm. and that's like the best kind of thing to achieve um for sure mm-hmm. right um and i i, I just want to say because nintendo has been the quiet one today and uh i just i just so i know unusual. he's not going to say it per usual but i i know he's not going to say it but i'm going to say it which is he's very hard to please especially when it comes to comedy true that it's really true. like I'm very I'm, well. Like, I mean, I'm picky in general with movies, but yeah, this yeah. movie I, I did not think I was gonna like skeletons at all. And as as, as soon as that first scene came on, I was laughing. From it's that, like that point on, I was like, "It's ridiculous!" I'm I glad to hear I'm, that. I'm loving this. Thank you, Paul and Betty. When they're when they're like, you know, if 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 we find this meteor and it's real. It could mean memes. real things for the, the field real of science. Real advancements in the field of science. <laughs> real advancements for the yeah. field of science. I, I just love Betty's laugh, and then she does the sigh at the end. Hmm. Hmm. Oh, Paul. <laughs> oh, Paul. Hmm. <laughs> I love that. Good stuff. Yeah, Larry, uh, thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, this Can has I plug been... something before I go? Oh, oh I'm, I'm, I, I hope you do, yes. I'm, yeah, th- um, I'm going to thank you. Thank you so much and uh please thank plug you. away well thank you my it was my pleasure to be i enjoyed chatting with you guys and um well the kickstarter i'll mention that again you know the the kickstarter is happening now for uh the lunchbox the lost skeleton lunchbox and yes. uh, so check that out um but there's something else uh this is a whole different side of of my stuff and it's steam wars uh oh, nice. i'd say i haven't heard in a while yeah and i've partnered with a new company called created uh, C-R-E-A-T-D, uh, and we are putting out a hard copy of the graphic novel. All three of the books that were digitally available are going to be in one volume. So um, nice. that That's is awesome. uh, on That's the great. way. Uh, stay tuned for that. Steam Wars is a, a steampunk a- a- epic adventure that I've been developing for years, and um, there's at steamwars.com will show you what that looks like. So there. Yeah, Steam Wars. Uh, that I is awesome. Was, uh, afraid to ask because you kind of haven't talked about it. Talk, talk. You haven't talked I about talked it about it. Yeah, in a while. <laughs> right, right. And, and you know, and I have, I tend to have a lot of irons in the fire all the time, and so I, uh, you know, I get caught up in this and that. But I'm so happy to be back to it, and uh, and uh, excited that the uh, it's going to be trade paperback, basically uh, uh, style graphic. That's phenomenal. And And is that also going to be a Kickstarter or are they? uh, No, that'll just be, uh, that'll just be uh, uh, coming out soon and stay tuned. Fantastic. That is so exciting. Yeah. I mean, I I love 
you know, I've gotten to see your artwork for Steam Wars, you know, through your Twitter over the years. And I just I love the the yeah. aesthetic of it. And you can tell how much passion you put into it. And like mm -hmm. you said, you know, a lot of irons in the fire. Um, you know, you just really appreciate you going for it with every mm -hmm. creative endeavor and not worrying about a brand of like, I need to do the Larry you know, Blamire thing. I have yeah, to people make expect it a lampoon. Uh, comedy, so you know, I have to it's like no. You're like I, I, I want to write these. You know, short. You know, I want to do this collection of comics. I want to do these weird western. Want to do the steampunk comic. And um, yeah, honestly, I really appreciate that about you. And hats off to you for sticking oh, to you. your creative side. You know, because it keeps thank it so interesting much. as a fan. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm real excited. I'll definitely be picking up that collection. Oh, absolutely. Uh, thank trade. you for sure. For sure. For sure. Thanks, guys. I really appreciate it. I uh, enjoyed being on. Yeah, great. Nice. Yeah, Actually, the world, I, I the... have I have one more question. Oh. It, it has nothing to do with skeletons or anything. Um, you've done like parodies of like you know the sci-fi horror and all that stuff. Have you thought about doing like animation, like cartoon shows that are, like uh, stylized you know, we... like like in the sixties, like Scooby Doo or something? Well, we've kind of you know um, I did a little animation of Big Dan Freighter for the Kickstarter that we did. Uh, for the Big Dan Freighter uh, uh, Volume Two, and um, I, you know, that's something I'd like to see happen again or pursue again. Is 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 Big Dan Freighter as a cartoon series? I think that would be kind of fun. Um, and and we've thought about that, so we'll see. We'll see. Nice, nice. But, I, think, uh, I think that'd be fun. Yeah, that'd be fun to see. Cool. Um, All right. My final question before you go, I just, I just, uh, I, I have to ask this because I'm dying to know this. So. Why is there no Blu-ray for the original Lost Skeleton of Kadesh? Well, that's a good question, and uh, I, I I hope there will be one. I'm still, you know, I still want to see that happen. I don't have a better answer than that, except that I don't feel like that's that's complete until we get that out there. Is is it is it like a rights thing or something like that? No, it's you know, uh, it it the film is at Sony, and uh, Mill Creek has the DVD rights, so um, it's 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 tricky, but we'll see what happens. Gotcha. All right. Okay. All right, guys. Well, thanks for uh, right. listening and thanks to Larry for coming on. This has been absolutely a blast and uh, everybody uh, have a good night. Um, I think I speak for all of us when I say I sleep now. <laughs> thanks, guys. Thanks so much, Larry. Take care. Thank you. Retro. Retro.